What is the story of America? Is there such a thing? Is there only one story or are there many stories? And if there are many stories, how are they woven? How can they be woven together to tell the story of America? Those are the questions we'll seek to answer here in this conversation. The fifth installment of Dr. Andrew Roth's The American Tapestry Project, we tell ourselves stories as we now turn our attention to the immigrant's tale. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson Educational Society and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Joining me in conversation is Dr. Roth, a scholar in residence at the Jefferson, and he's also the host of the American Tapestry Project radio program, which airs on WQLN Public Media and is available online at wqln.org, as well as the NPR One app. Now, after a deep examination of 1968, the year America shattered, according to Smithsonian Magazine, Dr. Roth launched his exploration of the American narrative, or narratives. In August, Dr. Roth and I took a look at the overview of his The American Tapestry Project, and on September 29th, we began looking more deeply into Dr. Roth's tapestry project, looking at the weaving of that tapestry thread by thread over the course of several episodes as we examine the American narrative. Videos of past programs, as well as other discussions featuring Dr. Roth, are available for on-demand streaming at jeserie.org. In past episodes, we've examined humans as storytellers, freedom's story at home and abroad, freedom's fault lines focusing on race and gender, and the American dream, success stories, Horatio Alger, and a nation of hustlers. Here, we'll turn now to The Immigrant's Tale in part five of this series. Now, I'll look ahead. On Tuesday, November 10th at noon, we'll look at the fusion thread as Dr. Roth concludes this series. Also during that episode on Tuesday, November 10th at noon, uh, we're gonna look back on questions that we didn't get a chance to answer earlier and dive more deeply into conversation in some of the notes we wanted to unpack more. And of course, we're gonna take questions from you, the viewers, which you can send to us in advance. More to come on that later in this episode. Now, a quick note on Dr. Roth prior to joining the Jefferson. Uh, he had had an accomplished career in academia from lecturing to leading. He taught various courses before going on to serve in administrations in Erie and lead the Notre Dame College in Cleveland as its president before retiring and being named president emeritus. Now, breaking free from the tightening grip of retirement, Dr. Roth heeded the call to serve as the interim president at St. Bonaventure University. Now, seeing his vulnerability when it comes to maintaining a relationship with retirement, we at the Jefferson wrangled him in, where he's been serving ever since as a scholar in residence, offering numerous lectures, producing plenty of publications, and facilitating the Ramey Fellowship Program. Since this conversation is first airing live on the Jefferson's Facebook page, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this event, still send us your questions and comments and we'll get them along to Dr. Roth. And of course, for more information about both past and upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please do visit jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. Andrew Roth, thank you for joining me for part five of this conversation. Good to be with you, Ben. Uh, somewhat surprising that this is number five. Uh, uh, the whole thing went rather quickly. I'm still a little puzzled by that. But in any event, uh, that was a very good summary you did. I think that, that'll help me go rather quickly over the next couple slides. But today, in part five of the American Tapestry Project, we're going to talk about the immigrant's tale, which could be, arguably, one of the most important of the various threads. Uh, everyone uh, listening to this program, uh, either Either, either simultaneously with us during this live stream or who look at it later on our YouTube channel or at the, the Jefferson's website, everyone listening to this program is descended from an immigrant. Uh, some sooner, some later, some willing, some unwilling, but everyone is descended from an immigrant. We are, we are truly, as we will see, a, a nation of immigrants. Uh, obviously, there is one rather large exception to that. Uh, and that, of course, are Native Americans. And so unless uh, you happen to be descended from an indigenous ancestry, uh, you're descended from an immigrant. So part five, the immigrant's tale. Uh, ever so quickly, the American Tapestry Project, as Ben uh, went through it, uh, a tapestry is a special kind of weaving. Uh, in a tapestry, you don't see the warp threads. Those are the threads that hold the weaving together. Uh, but they obviously are important because they hold the weaving together. Um, 
And as we use the metaphor of the tapestry for the American Tapestry Project, I think there are three or four warp threads, fundamental foundational values and themes in American history and culture that in fact hold the whole story of America together. And they're obviously freedom, equality, and opportunity, uh, the ongoing 244 years and running experiment in self-government, uh, which has really only broken down once, but although it's threatened to break down any number of times. Uh, and then number three, and this ties directly into the immigrant's tale, while we're simultaneously trying to create a culture of freedom, equality, and opportunity, uh, doing what in 1776 was a radical innovation, uh, create our own government, the government of the, cons the consensus government, the government of those who consented to be governed. Well, we're trying to do those two things, which uh, remain radical, well, they're perhaps not so radical in 2020 as they did in 1776, but still fairly outliers in human history. When we're trying to do that, we're also trying to do something that possibly one could argue has never been done before or has been done repeatedly. It's an interesting topic. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe in the questions in episode six. But while we've been attempting to blend diverse people into a people, taking people from everywhere in the world, uh, we tend to always think of immigration as East Coast. We're going to discover today that it was also very much, very importantly, also West Coast. But attempting to blend diverse people into a people, as in, of course, uh, that glittering phrase in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people. In fact, one of the major threads would be, and I think people can see my cursor on the we, is the ever-expanding definition of the we uh, in we the people. And we'll talk a, a lot about that on November 10th because that, in fact, is the fusion thread. Well, if those are the warp threads, the foundational, the fundamental values and themes that hold the whole thing together, what are the weft threads, the weft threads, the explain the tapestry metaphor, are the threads that you can actually see in a tapestry that depict a, well, that portray a picture or tell a story. Uh, and there are at least six, and each of these has innumerable sub-threads, but each of these come together, if you can envision a tapestry, in clusters of stories. We tell our sort of stories, humans are storytellers, I'll come back to that in a minute. But also we have freedom story at home and abroad. What does freedom and liberty mean? What, what, do, what do we mean at home and what do we mean uh, our impact uh, beyond the nation's borders? Freedom's fault lines, uh, stories of race and gender, uh, stories really about people who were initially excluded from that freedom at home and who fought for their inclusion by appealing to those values uh, of liberty, equality, and uh, freedom and opportunity. And then the American dream. As we said last week, Cal Coolidge may or may not have ever said the business of America was business, but regardless of whether Silent Cal said it, he wouldn't have been wrong. Uh, if the business of America is not business, it's certainly a major part of uh, the American story, uh, uh, the American people and their entrepreneurial spirit. And today, we're going to look at the immigrant's tale. We're going to we're going to take, admittedly, a view from 30,000 feet, but actually we're going to come down to ground on a couple of issues. Uh, the story of how the, who those diverse people were and how they got here and what reception they encountered when they got here. And then on November 10th, we'll try to pull that all together with what I call the fusion thread uh, and actually hopefully look forward. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give the folks, Ben, and my uh, email address plus what can be posted on Facebook and elsewhere to, to really kind of see if, the, you know, some questions and try to flesh out some of these ideas because even though we've been at this now for five weeks, it's a big story. <laughs> it's a very big story. Um, it's the story or the stories of America. Speaking of stories, the uh, underlying metaphor or the underlying thesis, if, they, if the metaphor of the American tapestry is tapestry, the underlying thesis is humans are storytellers. They build cultures by telling themselves stories. They use those stories to bind themselves one to another so that they can engage in great acts of collaboration and essentially uh, create meaning for themselves and for others. Uh, we tell ourselves stories in order to understand our experience, but we also tell ourselves stories to bind and create cultures. So humans are storytellers and the American tapestry is really the tapestry, the 
the weaving together of the many threads and the many stories that are America, because it's probably not possible to tell the story of America, but perhaps you can share the stories of America and see how uh, they weave together to make, at times, a coherent whole, at other times, perhaps, uh, a disputatious, to use a fancy word, uh, whole. So today, immigration, the immigrant's tale. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, everyone listening to this program is descent, or everyone other than someone who is descended from a Native American. Uh, so I'm going to say 98% of the people listening to this program are descended from immigrants. Some sooner, some later, some willing, some unwilling. But everybody is descended from somebody who came from someplace else. Uh, and that is a key theme in the American story. And talking about the immigrant's tale, it also leads immediately to a question of what does it mean to be a citizen? Who gets to be a citizen? I talked about who's included and who's excluded. And as I think about the American tapestry and those fundamental threads we looked at, uh, in freedom's fault lines, we spend a great deal of time talking about it. And it might be that there needs to be another th major thread, weft thread, and that would be the story of the people who were originally ex excluded. Uh, they did not, they were not included, they did not benefit uh, from our glittering ideals of these truths. All men are created equal. They were excluded from that. And one of the exclusions was citizenship. Who got to be a citizen? And actually to today, right down to DACA, uh, is who gets to be a citizen and who doesn't? And how is that described? Or how is that determined? Well, the very first thing would be to ask yourself, what does it mean to be a citizen? And that's one of those things like fish and water we don't think a lot about unless we happen to be a member of those groups, of one of those groups uh, that's excluded or whose right to be a citizen is challenged. Uh, historically, and I, I do see, unfortunately, uh, the, um, the, the, the Zoom taskbar up there is uh, blocking out a line, but what that line says is citizenship is understood as a right to have rights. If you are a citizen, you have the right to claim the rights of citizenship as defined and protected by the U.S. Constitution and all subsequent jurisprudence. Uh, so it serves, citizenship serves as the foundation of your fundamental rights derived and protected by the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Article I of the Constitution explicitly, explicitly grants Congress the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization, which interestingly enough wasn't done until after the Civil War. Um, and that would have been in the 14th Amendment. The Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, stipulated two paths to citizen, citizenship. One, birthright. You are born here. And that is fairly straightforward. And some people think by executive order, a president or someone could wipe that out or the Supreme Court did, could declare it null and void. No, it's embedded in the Constitution. And actually, uh, in the post-Civil War Congresses, they actually did that as a constitutional amendment to protect it from the Supreme Court and to protect it from uh, the executive branch of the government. Now, what does birthright citizenship mean? It's really simple. If you were born on the, on the property or on the land or the soil of the United States of America, you're an American citizen, end of discussion. Uh, the other path is naturalization. You can emigrate here, and then after a certain period of time, uh, you take a test, which I would suspect most Americans who were born here would have a, might find that test a little more challenging than they think, because it's largely a, a test on American history and civics how the American system is supposed to work. Uh, you take that test, you pass it, you swear your allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, and you're a citizen. Uh, as I said, these are specified in the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment, uh, and all persons born or naturalized are therefore are subject and are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. Uh, constitutionally, that's the only real statement in the Constitution about citizenship. And like I said, it really wasn't made explicit until after the Civil War. Um, 
and, and immigration, really, the first immigration law we'll see in a moment doesn't uh, happen until 1870. What are the duties and obligations of a citizen? This is something people don't actually think about very often. They think about their rights, uh, whether or not they have the obligation to wear a mask, for example. But uh, we'll come back to that. What rights do you have as a citizen? Well, you have immunities, which is a frank, uh, a legal term that says, as a citizen, you are immune to certain actions of the government, and those actions are spelled out in the Bill of Rights and all subsequent jurisprudence. So, for example, uh, you are immune from an accusation of libel or slander unless the person who claims you slandered them can prove you did it. Turns out, you know, we, we, I don't want to go too far off on that one. That might not have been the best example because it's tricky. Uh, uh, if I call uh, Sam, whatever, some epithet, and Sam goes, oh, I'm not that, uh, because of the presumption of innocence, everything reverses itself. Sam has to do two things, has to prove that I actually called him that. That should be simple enough. I might have written it, spoken it, it's recorded. But the second thing, and this is where it gets tricky, Sam has to prove he's not whatever it is I called him, which is why uh, you don't see a lot of slander in libel suits, it's tricky. But you're granted uh, those immunities. Uh, for example, uh, the Fourth Amendment, I think it is, I hope I got that right, <laughs> right, uh, against uh, illegal searches and seizures. Uh, you have the freedom to reside and work here, the freedom to enter and leave. You have, and next Tuesday, it's a big deal. We're, we're seeing, uh, right now that you have the right to vote, but that right's been content, contested from time to time by people. Uh, there have been from time to time attempts to uh, deny you that right, or at least make it more difficult for you, particularly if you're a member of certain groups to vote, but it's embedded in your right as a citizen. You have the right to stand for public office and the right to apply for federal employment. Well, those are your rights. What's your duties? What are your duties as a citizen? There are actually really only four. You could probably say five. It's not to, uh, five would be to not advocate sedition, et cetera, but, uh, et cetera. But basically, there are really only four. You, have, you, you are expected when called to serve on ju uh, jury duty. You're expected to pay your taxes. And you are expected to make yourself to be available for the census. The more interesting one that most people don't understand is citizenship also requires that you must participate in the military, which is another way of saying, uh, if the nation is threatened, threatened, excuse me, you are obligated to defend it. That's an ancient notion of citizenship that goes way back, you know, has, has almost nothing to do with, uh, with American citizenship. It is embedded in the notion of citizenship just about anywhere. Uh, and sometimes people forget that uh, because they'll say, well, what right does the government have to draft me? They have every right because it's one of your duties as a citizen. Uh, and so that one sometimes is forgotten. And then the benefits we, we've looked at over here because I kind of mentioned them when I was saying earlier. Uh, a brief history of citizenship, like I said, it hasn't been as clearly defined uh, as people thought. For example, the first attempt to define citizenship was the Naturalization Act of 1790. And remember, the Constitution was exactly a year old at this time. Uh, and so the, the, the founders were still feeling their way. Well, the Naturalization Act of 1790 explicitly restricted citizenship to free white persons of good character. There were three tests to become a citizen. One, you had to be free, which is to say you were not a slave or an indentured servant. You had to be white, which is to say you were neither a Native American nor an African American, nor, although Asian Americans were um, de minimis at this point in time, this was largely an, a, a restriction against African Americans and Native Americans. And then you had this somewhat ambiguous, what is good character? And, you know, the devil's in the details as that got defined. Um, there were a couple of uh, interesting things. In 1798, they increased the waiting period from five to 14 years, trying to slow it down. Because remember, there were no restrictions on immigration in the early republic prior to the Civil War. 
If you could get here, you, you got here. 1802, free white remained, but they decided that the resident children of naturalized citizens would also be considered citizens, which is to say people who had come, not been born here, who had come here and become citizens, their children were also citizens. Uh, Citizens' Right Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was an ins a major uh, contention that got Andrew Johnson impeached when he tried to veto it, affirmed that all citizens are equally protected by the law, and we've already talked about the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, an interesting one is, and we'll briefly touch on it later, is uh, the United States versus Wong Kim Ark in 1899 reaffirmed the birthright citizenship clause by saying the children of immigrants, in this instance, Chinese immigrants, were citizens. Uh, I'm going to come back to that case a little later. Uh, Native Americans have had an interestingly, <laughs> interesting is really a kind of um, insipid word in this context. Uh, in, Native Americans have had a thorny, and to say the least, contentious relationship uh, with the federal government. Uh, they were not universally or uniformly interested in becoming citizens because, of course, they were citizens of their own sovereign nations. That actual distinction continues down to today. In some instances, uh, the Iroquois passport issue uh, with the lacrosse team in the 20 teens. But the Indi Indian Citizenship Act, which was part of the Immigration Act of 1924 granted full use uh, citizenship to the indigenous peoples of the United States. Uh, and it was actually an act of gratitude for their service uh, in the American military in World War I. But as I said, not all Native Americans wanted that because what did that mean? Were they still citizens of their tribal nation? Uh, and we're still arguing about citizenship, as I mentioned earlier, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, created a pathway for citizenship for unauthorized children of unauthorized immigrants who came here before, before they were 18. Well, in any event, that, that's a, a snapshot uh, overview of what's meant by citizenship, something that is usually uh, taken for granted and glossed over. But as John F. Kennedy said, uh, we are a nation of immigrants. Uh, Ronald Takaki and his A Difference, A, a Different Mirror, uh, Kennedy looked at immigration to the United States primarily from Europe and in the East Coast, but Takaki reminds us that there is large sums, large numbers of Americans who entered the country from the South and the West, particularly Asian Americans in the West. And one of the best books, maybe the best book on the history of immigration in the United States is Tom, Tom Kajelton's A Nation of Nations, uh, the, that really America is a nation of nations. It's its own version of the League of Nations or World Nation, uh, United Nations. Uh, immigration has been you know, part of the story from the very beginning, colonial immigrants. Um, this is John Winthrop, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, that's William Penn. Actually, one of the earliest would have been John Smith coming to Captain John Smith in New England, uh, colonial uh, uh, home craft. And uh, this is from Plymouth Plantation, which is a really kind of cool reenacting place in, uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And of course, some people came against their will. And their role in American history uh, is a major role, as we all know. Uh, the guy whose face is unfortunately obliterated a little bit by the Zoom task bar is Paul Revere. And Paul Revere is descended from French Huguenot uh, immigrants who were fleeing religious persecution in France. And the great mid, the immigrants tale, the great mid 19th century, the first major wave, and actually the first major wave of non English immigration prior, uh, throughout the 16th, 17th, well, forget the 16th, throughout the 17th and 18th century, the major movement of peoples to the United States were from what we would call, uh, were English and of course, uh, a smattering of Northern Europeans and, and Germans who annoyed Benjamin Franklin because they persisted or insisted on speaking German. In fact, they so much annoyed Benjamin Franklin and others that they were discriminated against in Philadelphia and moved to what was then, and I'll go back, uh, 
moved Pennsylvania Dutch down here and moved to what was then the extreme outskirts of Pennsylvania, of Philadelphia, and founded their own town, Germantown, which anyone listening who's been to Philadelphia has probably driven through or if not stayed in Germantown. And today you, it's simply a name on a map. Uh, it's Germanic influence. And unless you go to some museums or historic centers, uh, you might not even understand why in fact it's called Germantown, but it's called Germantown for the very obvious reasons. That's where the Germans who annoyed Benjamin Franklin went. So in any event, the, the first major wave of uh, non-English, if you will, 19th century immigration was, of course, the Irish, Germans. This is a different wave. Uh, the Germans who annoyed Franklin were essentially pietists. The Germans who came in the early and middle 19th century were Roman Catholics, as were the Irish. And they both, the Irish and the Roman Catholics, were brutally discriminated against. There was also, and they're a stand-in, the Swedish, the Swedes are a stand-in, there was also a Scandinavian uh, influx that actually moved past the eastern United States and settled in the what is now the upper Midwest, which is why uh, northern Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and even the Dakotas have a very uh, Scandinavian air to their towns and, uh, and cities. And then, of course, on the extreme West Coast, you had the beginning with the California Gold Rush in 1849 of immigration coming from the other direction. Uh, largely Chinese laborers, men, who really had no intention of staying. They came, they wanted to work and send their money back home. But uh, the gold and silver mines of the West, and then later we'll discover the railroad, were essentially built by Chinese laborers who were brutally discriminated against. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in English, in American English vernacular or slang, there is now the politically incorrect phrase that I'm sure many people have heard, you don't have a Chinaman's chance. And people might think, where does that come from? What, what does that mean? Well, needing work, it was only the Chinese who would volunteer or be forced to climb up alongside the side of a mountain ridge, plant the explosive dynamite device to blow open to begin to dig a mine. And of course, those days, you aren't talking about electronic, you know, there's no Bluetooth, there's no electronic uh, fuses, you're talking about a physical fuse. So once you lit the fuse, you had however long that fuse took to burn to get off that mountain. Hence the phrase, you don't have a Chinaman's chance, because of course, the fuses were fragile, the preference of the mine owners was short fuses, uh, which is where the expression you have a short fuse comes from. It doesn't take much to get you to blow up. So right there, you see the, um, the dichotomy in American history of welcoming the Irish and the Chinese and the Germans for their labor, but not particularly being thrilled about their culture they brought with them. And this is a sign that would have been very common in Boston and New York in the middle 19th century. Irish need not apply. Um, because of that heavy influence of Roman Catholic Germans and Irish coming in the early 19th century, it was actually called the American Party. It got, it got the nickname, the Know Nothing Party, because when people were asked, when members of the American Party were asked about it because it was an explicitly, overtly racist, anti-immigrant, anti-Irish, anti-German uh, group. Uh, people would say, members when asked about it would say, I know nothing. I know nothing about it. Uh, and it was the American Party. And this was a stylized image that was used to um, popularize it in the 19th century. And that, of course, is citizen know nothing. And he, that isn't a real person, it's a stylized image, but citizen know nothing, uh, one with the aquiline nose, uh, the kind of elegant look, uh, represented the Anglo-Saxon ideal uh, that needed to be protect, protected against this uh, influx of uh, aliens. And of course, those influx of aliens are Irish and Germans. Uh, these are know nothing thugs uh, trying to intimidate the Irish and the Germans and those who would support them from voting, a theme that uh, continues into the present. Uh, Millard Fillmore, Buffalo's Millard Fillmore, I don't want to anger any Buffalonians, but he uh, 
Well, he would now be under some challenge as the most racist president in American history, but he would be uh, on the short list of contenders for that. And he was one of the candidates of the Know Nothing Party. And of course, up here you have, what? why were the Germans and the Irish uh, so discriminated against? You've got the Irish with their whiskey kind of hidden behind Ben and I over here is the Germans with their beer. And in fact, it's, it is uh, the temperance movement uh, of the early 19th century, which overlaps on the positive side with the abolition movement and the movement for women's rights. But the temperance movement was also anti-Irish and anti-German and the fact that the Irish liked their whiskey and their beer and the Germans liked their beer. Uh, and that's where, sun, that's where uh, law, Sunday laws, uh, blue laws came in uh, opposing uh, closing bars on the one day of week, the one day a week that German immigrants didn't work. And of course, without getting into German culture, the Turnverein or Turners, the notion of uh, an outdoor picnic or picnic grounds where they drank beer and ate food, this was what they did on Sundays. The temperance movement attempted to shut that down and then specifically uh, anti German um, activity. So, what are the three major legislative acts that impact uh, immigration in America? I've already touched on the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Immigration Act of 1924 was the first, not the first, but it was the strongest act to restrict, not only to control, but to reduce immigration. And then probably one of the most consequential pieces of legislation that most Americans don't know much about, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is exactly what it says. It kicked the Chinese out or tried to kick those who were here out, and it also wanted to restrict and prohibit any more Chinese from coming. Uh, we've got a couple of tables we're going to look at, and I'm, only, I'm not going to go over all of them. But uh, the first attempt to control immigration was the Naturalization Act of 1870. But in 1875, the Page Act, the federal government established control of immigration policy and said it was a federal, not a state issue. States could not control immigration in and out of their, in and out of them. It was the federal government's control over all of the states and there would be a uniform national policy. And that's the Page Act of 1875, which also had as a subset of it that it banned, outright banned the immigration of Chinese women uh, under the assumption that any Chinese woman who came to the West Coast in the middle of the 19th century was a prostitute uh, coming to make uh, earn money by servicing Chinese laborers. Uh, so it's both racist and sexist. That was the Page Act. And that led to, in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which just banned, China, prohibited, it restricted it, and then prohibited Chinese from becoming citizen. It restricted the immigration to a very small amount and anybody who could somehow manage to get here they were prohibited from becoming United States citizens and that was renewed in 1892 and 1902 and it was only repealed in 1943 so this is an ancient history it might be ancient history to you Ben but it's not ancient history to me because it's three years before I was born and I know a number of people listening today this happened in your lifetime so why in 1943 did we suddenly get religion and permit Chinese to come well, we have to be fighting their mortal enemies, the Japanese in a, in a Pacific War, and we needed them as allies. And so we had to uh, say, oh, yeah, you're good. <laughs> uh, and that, that's exactly why that happened. I touched on earlier, United States versus Wong Kim Ark. That is a famous case because it reaffirms birthright citizenship. Wong Kim Ark was a young man who was the son of Chinese immigrants, not citizens, of a Chinese mother and father in San Francisco who had gotten here, but of course were not citizens. But Wong Kim Ark was born in the United States. Um, he returned to China to take care of some business for his parents when he got to be a young adult of 20 or 21. And then when he attempted to return, he was banned. They weren't going to let him in the country. And he sued the federal government saying, no, you have to let me in the country. I'm an American citizen. And in 1898, the Supreme Court in United States versus Wong Kim Ark found for Wong Kim Ark saying the children of immigrants, regardless of the citizenship status of the immigrants, the children of legal immigrants, 
are citizens of the, born on the born in the United States are citizens of the United States. Um, then we have the Immigration Act uh, of the three of that. I, we don't have time to go over all of these. Uh, and anyone, you know, because this will be posted to Facebook and to the Jefferson website, anyone who cares to can come back and look at some of these in more detail. Well, then coming into the late 19th, early 20th century, you have what most people would think was the greatest wave of immigration in American history. And uh, you probably could hear in my voice a catch there. Uh, most people who would think that would be wrong. The greatest wave of immigration in American history is right now, which is one of the reasons we are having the arguments that we're having that are exact replays of the arguments of the middle 19th century, early 20th. The late 19th and early 20th century was characterized by a massive immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. And this is a smattering of these folks. These are Italian immigrants. These people here dancing, are Saxon, uh, Transylvania Saxons, of whom I happen to be descended from. And this is a Hungarian woman, a Polish woman, Russian Jews, uh, Greek, Im Greek immigrants down here, uh, Norwegians here, I believe that was. And if you look, they all look alike, ultimately. Forget their ethnicity. They're just, I'm not going to say desperate people, but they are in some ways Pe desperate people who had the courage to get up and go looking for something better. Um, and if we had the soundtrack to this that we did when we do this at the Jefferson, I always use the Neil Diamond, uh, the song America from the jazz singer. Uh, on, boats and on boats and planes, they're coming to America. Uh, just want to be free. Uh, and this is an interesting thing. Let's hope it works here. This is Thomas Edison. The birth of film. There's no, if by some chance you hear sound, this is a fluke. Uh, it didn't work the other day when Ben and I tried it. The sound would have been added later, but this was taken by Thomas Edison's film crew in 1903 of uh, the ships, the immigrant ship, the transoceanic ship would have docked in New York Harbor. Then these ferries would have come and got the people and then taken them to Ellis Island. I can hear the water. Can you hear the water? No, I'm not going to play the whole thing in the interest of time, but I do want you to see the part where they disembark. Uh, you could possibly, somebody watching this today could possibly be looking at your grandmother, your great grandmother, or your great great grandmother. Not entirely impossible. Well, uh, that, that, you can find that video, by the way, at the Library of Congress. Uh, and as I said, somebody watching today may have seen just through a, it'd be a statistical long shot, but your, your grandmother or your great grandmother, or your, depending on your age, your great great grandmother. Well, that influx of Southern and Eastern Europeans got an enormous and violent, not so much physically violent, but intellectually and politically violent backlash against them. Uh, there was a strong attempt to restrict them as un-American and not the kind of people we want to have here. Henry Cabot Lodge Sr. from Massachusetts was a prime mover in that. It's gonna end up under Ben and I's faces, but Prescott Hall uh, and Henry Cabot Lodge found, you can see the document that the Immigration Restriction League, which they thought and which they wanted to do to ban those people you just saw getting off the boat 
uh, many of some of you listening, your ancestors, if they weren't in that film, they, they had a very similar experience. They walked right through that same place. Uh, Lodge and Hall characterized them as the mongrel scum of Southern and Eastern Europe. And as on one side of my family, the grandson and the other, the great grandson of that mongrel scum of Eastern Europe, I take great offense at that uh, on their behalf 120, 100 and some years, 150 years later. Uh, Lodge and Hall in the, anti, in the Immigration Restriction League found, uh, wanted to impose a literacy test that you couldn't get in the country unless you were literate, that is, you could read and write. Now, they did make one concession. It was read and not read and write English. That would have been too blatant. They figured that most of these people were illiterate, so can you read and write your native language? Uh, and if you couldn't read it, you couldn't get in. Uh, their anti-immigration thing also coincided with, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the pseudoscience of eugenics. Uh, they, they use the word race in a way we don't use the word race. They consider, they use race in the way we would use the words nationality or ethnicity. And they considered the English and the Nordic to be a race. They did not consider all white people to be white. The only true white people were people of Anglo-Saxon and Nordic heritage. They had a problem because by this time the Germans had become major players in America and they uh, since I'm also of German ancestry, and since they're a, a, a reasonably, and I'm being, uh, I'm being facetious, they're a very bright and industrious group, they had to try to figure out how to include the Germans, so they created a category called Alpine. Somehow, if you were Alpine, you were an honorary white Northern European in their mind. In any event, eugenics and Charles Davenport was the pseudoscience of eugenics that tried to produce a, a history of Europe based upon the, the racial composition of the various countries. And of course, the thing that always stymied them that they couldn't figure out how to do is how to account for the Romans and the Greeks. And they then did two things, back to that Alpine, they said, well, they were actually Alpine people. And then when that didn't make a heck of a lot of sense, they said, well, uh, 19th century Greeks and, Ro and Italians are not the same people who the Romans and the ancient Greeks were. They, uh, uh, and you know, they were doing all kinds of uh, mental gymnastics here, trying to justify their discrimination. But in any event, the eugenics movement, they even had uh, a perfect girl triumph, uh, the, the beautiful baby, ba better baby contests. They wanted Americans of white Northern European ancestry to produce more children. You hear actually echoes of that today from Steve Bannon and Steve Miller. Uh, and we're gonna look at some birth rates in a moment. Uh, but interestingly enough, African-American uh, children and the children of immigrants were banned from participating in the Better Baby contest. Uh, they wanted only healthy seed to be sown. Uh, and then, because they were getting concerned that they were going to be overrun by the, the mongrel scum of Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Senator Dillingham from Vermont uh, was put in charge of a commission uh, the Dillingham Commission, this is him down here, and 1907, they came up with, there's a conceptual dichotomy. Old immigrants, that is, people from the British Isles, not the Irish, not yet. The Irish had not yet gained uh, admission as being white, uh, but the English, the Scots, uh, Norwegians, and the Germans, particularly the Northern Germans, uh, uh, they were, but the new immigrants were very different. They said Southern and Eastern Europeans threatened U.S. society. Does this sound familiar to anybody today? We get the same themes, the same tropes, just different people are being criticized. And uh, Madison Grant uh, wrote The Passing of the Great Race. He's the guy, he was actually the, the head of the Natural History Museum in New York. They've changed his name uh, recently because he was such an overt and vicious racist, uh, wrote The Passing of the Great Race. And then Lothrop Stoddard wrote The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. F. Scott Fitzgerald mocked both of these guys in The Great Gatsby uh, when he talked about, uh, uh, I think, I forget what he called his character's name, but Tom Buchanan, the, the main character, starts talking about how it's all very scientific, you know, uh, dark people are just going to overrun us and we're going to be ruined. One of the interesting things is one of the first people who read 
Madison Grant and Lothrop Stoddard and paid attention to Charles Davenport and eugenics, very close attention to it, was an obscure uh, German political activist in the early 1920s named Adolf Hitler. And he talked about it in Mein Kampf, and this is documented, it's read Mein Kampf. He talked about it, and quite frankly, he and Goebbels, when we turned against them, were stunned because they thought initially they were doing what we had given the scientific validity to. In any event, that led to a great reduction of, of immigration, and the, that, all of this led to the Immigration Act of 1924 and a reduction. And the Immigration Act, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on number 17, but the Immigration Act of 1924 is a major act, a major. It, is, it imposed the first numeric limitation, quotas. It imposed the first quotas on immigration through the National Origins Formula, created the Border Patrol, upheld existing ban on non-white immigrants, including African immigrants, uh, and also immigrants from Asia, the Middle East, and India. It allowed for some restricted immigration from Latin America. It's named the Johnson-Reed Act after Representative Albert Johnson of Washington and U.S. Senator, a Republican from Pennsylvania, David Reed. And the Immigration Act of 1924 was called the National Origins Act, and we're going to look at that in a, why it was called that in a minute. Key provisions. It limited immigration to 165,000 for countries outside the Western Hemisphere and barred immigrants from Asia. Well, who are the countries inside the Western Hemisphere? Canadians could come if they were of a mind to. Uh, Mexicans were needed as laborers uh, agricultural laborers in the Southwest, were, and that gets to be a major issue. Um, when I was the president of Notre Dame College, I looked at opening up a branch in Goodyear, Arizona, which is a suburb on the far west, on the west side of Phoenix, and it's called Goodyear because Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company had a cotton plantation there because they used cotton, they wove it inside the fiber of tires, uh, and that cotton wasn't farmed by people from Akron, Ohio. It was farmed by, well. Braceros, we're going to come to in a moment, uh, Mexican laborers. Uh, it set nationality quotas at 2% of foreign born persons of that nationality residing in the United States in 1890. Now remember, this is 1924. We're 34 years later. Why 1890? Because 1890 was just was the last census just before the great explosion of immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. And so if you limit the number, let's say Italians, who can immigrate to America to 2% of the population of Italians in the United States in 1890, you radically reduce that number. And you'll see in a moment what happened. Gave 85% of the quota to, guess what? Northern and Western Europe. And anybody else who had an education or trade who could fit inside. Uh, those quotas. Uh, Non-quota status to wise had established the counselor system, established the border patrol. We had already talked about that. Well, what were the consequences? What resulted from that? It reduced immigration from 300 and in round numbers, 358,000 in 1923-24 to 164,000 in 1924-25, which is to say it cut it in half. In fact, more than half. Immigration from Italy fell 90%. It was choked off. Uh, provisions of the act were so restricted that in 1924, more Italians, Czechs, Yugoslavs, more Southern and Eastern Europeans, with some Chinese and Japanese thrown in, left the United States than arrived as immigrants. It completely reversed everything. And it had a big consequence later in World War II because Eastern European immigration didn't be become substantial till after 1890, the Jewish diaspora, which largely was in Eastern Europe, was prohibited from immigrating and escaping Hitler's tyranny. And that's a, a, a story that needs you know, to be looked at uh, and talked about. Well, quickly again, I mentioned the Mexican repatriation. Most Americans don't know about this. That possibly should be bolded. Uh, because of the Great Depression, one million Mexican and Mexican-Americans uh, suspected of making the economic downturn worse. That is, they were here and out of work and made it look bad, were repatriated 
forced to return to Mexico. But they then discovered, uh-oh, we need agricultural workers. So in 1942, the Bracero program was created that recruited 4.6 million Mexican workers for agricultural jobs. So the entire immigration issue along the southern border of the United States in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California is far more complicated, far more complicated than current politics makes it seem. And then if you want to really want to add a level of complexity to it, in 1942, it was not yet quite 100 years since the end of the Mexican War. Uh, nobody was still alive then. The Displaced Persons Act of 1948 was an attempt to provide, uh, after the fact, because of what I mentioned earlier, refuge, uh, places for refugees from the destruction and devastation of World War II. Uh, the Hart Seller Act, however, of 1965 uh, uh, is really critical. It repealed that 1924 national origin quota system and replaced it with a visa system for family reunification. Let's talk about the 1965 Immigration Act. It was named after Emanuel Seller of New York. Uh, he was a representative from Brooklyn. He was Jewish, and he was a bitter opponent of the 1924 Immigration Act, just in general, as discriminatory against Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans, and Eastern Europeans. But he also understood what the 1890 thing did to the Jewish population who might have wanted to immigrate here, and Senator Philip Hart from Michigan. They were the sponsors of it in many ways, however, not the main players. What was the Immigration Act of 1965, which we are today? Most of the immigration turbulence in America today is an after-the-fact reaction to the unintended consequences of this law. Well, it abolished the national origins quota that we just talked about. Therefore, it eliminated the national origin, race, and ancestry as a base for immigration. That sounds like progress. It created a seven-category preference system that gave priority to the relatives of U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents, and then also to professionals and others with specialized skills which is one of the reasons why there are so many South Asian Indian physicians in the United States. It's a direct result of that law and that line right there. Immediate relatives and special immigrants were not subject to numerical restrictions. Well, what's a special immigrant? Foreign medical graduates. For the first time, immigration from the Western Hemisphere was limited. Quotas were imposed upon both Canadians, although somewhat milder there, but also from south of the American border. The Immigration and Nationality Act had a profound uh, implication. Hiram Fong, the senator from Hawaii, argued that Asians represented six-tenths of a percent of U.S. population, and since you could only get visas if you were members of a fam family members, and they'll never reach one percent. The cultural pattern of the U.S. will not change. Well, Hiram was either being disingenuous or didn't understand what was going to happen. In 2017, Asian Americans represent 6.9% of the population and the fastest growing racial and ethnic minority in the country. Or the put it in round numbers is now seven times, uh, it's almost more than eight times as great as it was then. Michael Fian from our, 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 our neighboring city of Cleveland, Ohio, he's a Democratic representative from then, um, wanted to stop. Immigration, interesting, uh, name Fian, he's Irish, but uh, you know, one generation gets here, two or three generations later, they pull up the ladder, uh, as the expression goes. He wanted to restrict immigration to Europeans. He didn't want to change the character of American culture. So he thought, let's give visas to family members of people who are already living in the United States and are citizens of the United States. And therefore, we should get immigration that would look like the way the United States was currently composed. So if 10% of the country was just to throw a number out Irish, 10% of the immigrants would be Irish. And I'm not picking on the Irish, it just happens Fian was Irish, so please, no letters in mail. I'm just using that as an example. Um, my mother's Hungarian, I'll use Hungarian then. If 10, well, if 2% of the population was Hungarian, then 2% per, per of the immigrants would be Hungarian. But what he didn't calculate was 
that people who were here from colonial times or the 19th century, and even many of the people who had immigrated in the late 19th and early 20th century, you are now talking about grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. They didn't have any family in the old country. They didn't know who those people were. Who did? It was only the most recent immigrants. And so a, a recent immigrant, now I'm not going to use any country because I don't want to get, I, I'm just talking here in the abstract. So immigrants, recent immigrants who had come in the last 30, 40, 50 years, uh, they could bring a wife. They could bring children. They could bring siblings. But once the siblings are here, they could bring a wife and children. And then, and so what you ended up with is the unintended consequence was, well, you have one of the great explosions of immigration. As I said earlier, the greatest, and actually I'm all for it, just so don't, don't, I don't want anybody hearing something I'm not saying. I think this is actually a positive thing in American history, uh, but uh, there are people who disagree with me. <laughs> uh, that resulted in a major immigration of Vietnamese refugees. Chinese and Japanese, South Asian Indians, that's a Brazilian holiday, Chinatown, uh, uh, Koreans, Latin Americans, Filipino nurses, uh, people from the Middle East, and as we know at the Jefferson, working with different people, people from Eastern Europe fleeing the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. A completely different mosaic, I think, than Senator uh, Representative Fian expected to see. Uh, uh, wrapping it up, the Immigration Act of 1990 eliminated the discrimination against gay people. Uh, Donald Trump wasn't the first one to build a border wall. That started in 1994. And then, of course, the, def of course, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals who came with Ill unauthorized immigrants but were brought as children. What's the impact of all of this? Well, again, it's kind of hidden by Ben and I here, but the number in absolute numbers. Right now, in 20, well, this is in 2019, I got this chart. We have the highest number in absolute numbers, about 44 million Americans were born elsewhere. It's the highest number in American history, if you go across here. Far, it dwarfs, uh, well, 1920, it, would, it, it dwarfs that 14,000 by a factor of almost three. A little less melodramatic is to look at it as a Portion because there are 330 million Americans. So proportionately, the percentage of foreign born, of course, was at its highest just before World War. This is the decline of World War One, just before World War One. And then you have the Immigration Act of 1924 combined with World War II, and you have just a complete collapse of or a major decrease of immigration. Well, you go from 12% uh, down to by the time you get to 1970 something around 4%, it's, it's been cut down by two thirds. Uh, but then something happens. Uh, these flat numbers here are absence of data, uh, but the curve goes back up to in 2019 again, you now have as a percentage about 13% of the population is foreign born, which lags that 15% or so in the early, 19, early 20th century, but it's much higher than most of the people, uh, ex uh, most living Americans experienced. And so uh, in absolute numbers, we are living through the greatest period of immigration in American history. Proportionately, it's the second greatest period of American immigration in American history. The composition of who those immigrants are has changed American culture. I would argue has changed American culture for the better. Uh, I'll give you one example. I spent, as Ben pointed out, some time as the president of St. Bonaventure University on the southern tier of New York. And if it weren't for South Asian Indians and, and, Pakistan, and doctors of Pakistani heritage, uh, there would be a very much smaller medical community uh, along that southern tier. So that combines with U.S. fertility hitting an all-time low. Remember, replacement is 2.1. And so if it were not for immigration, American population would be going down. 
uh, I'm just going to do a quick look at this. The general fertility rate uh, is 59 live births per thousand women ages 15 to 44. That would be a woman's fertile period, more generally spoken. The total fertility rate is the hypothetical lifetime births per woman is 1.73. You need 2.1, of course according to demographers to just replace the population. And the lifetime births completed, that is they gave birth to women aged 40 to 44, was only 1.86 in 2006. So the native population, uh, the, 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 the population in the United States would be, uh, would, would be shrinking if it were not for immigration. Uh, another part of that, and this leads of course to the culture wars that we've talked about repeatedly during this series. Once upon a time, America was a white Christian nation. Today, white Christians only compose 47% of the population. Uh, African Americans, though, non-white Christians, largely African Americans and Latinos, compose 24%. If you add those two together, 71% of Americans are still a Christian. 22% uh, define themselves as unaffiliated, and then we have a smattering of others. So that has changed it, and that leads to 21st century know-nothings. I should actually put on this slide, citizen know nothing from the 19th century, because these are his great, great, uh, great, great, maybe three great grandsons. Uh, Jerry Falwell, uh, who just fell from grace. Uh, I believe his name is Richard Jeffress, the head of a large evangelical church in Texas. The two Steves, the, uh, the White House anti-immigration bigots, Bannon and Miller, David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, even our beloved attorney general who seems to sympathize with them. So 21st century know-nothings. This book is by Robert P. Jones. He is not a 21st century know-nothing. He is a, a scholar who wrote a book, uh, the, the End of White Christian America, detailing the data that I just showed you on the previous slides. So on the one hand, even though I don't agree with these folks, I do understand the, the reaction. It, it is the reaction that happens in any group when strangers appear. Uh, since many of these people are Christians, they apparently did not read the uh, metaphor about the, uh, the, the, the proverb of the stranger in Genesis uh, when um, I'm drawing a blank myself, but uh, you know, that you, to be good to the stranger, because the stranger might turn out to be God, uh, they m must have skipped that chapter. But in human history, the rejection of the stranger is almost innate. So this is not unusual. I mean, uh, and it's, it's very much in the American grain. So that's the immigrant's tale. We're a t nation of nations. Uh, everyone listening into this is descended from somebody who had some role in those slides you just looked at. Everybody is descended from somebody who came from somewhere else. And as Ben said, we're going to do an episode six where we're going to try to um, pick out the highlights, the main themes, try to answer the questions and, and analyze uh, what does all of this mean? Uh, and, and we would love your questions. That Here are Ben and I's email addresses. Um, they're, re they're really quite simple. Uh, the only thing you really have to remember is at jeserie.org and just our last names. But uh, we'd love to hear your uh, reactions, whether you think the American Tapestry Project is, uh, is spot on or hogwash. Uh, and if you think it's hogwash, I'd, I'd like to know why. You can only uh, grow by, low, by, by learning your errors, I guess. But more importantly, we would like your questions about what do you think the themes are and, and what are questions that all of this has, has raised uh, that you now would like to mull over and think about. So thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Roth, for that, uh, another fantastic and fascinating and fact-filled uh, installment of the American Tapestry Project. I do want to just save the questions here because I know we got a late start today, folks. I, I really appreciate you sticking with us through some technical difficulties at the beginning. Uh, and a big thanks to Dr. Roth for sticking with us too through those tech difficulties to get through part five of the American Tapestry Project. Uh, so friendly reminder, our emails are right there on the screen, roth at jeserie.org and spagan at jeserie.org. 
Uh, as well, you can just leave those questions in the comment section to any one of the past videos uh, for parts one, two, three, four, and five, and we'll get to them uh, when we return here on Tuesday, November 10th at noon, when we take a look at the Fusion Thread, the final installment of this, and turn to Talking Tapestry to take a deep dive. So Dr. Andrew Roth, scholar in residence at the Jefferson Educational Society and host of the American uh, Tapestry Project radio show on WQLN Public Media with episodes available on the NPR One app as well as online at wqln.org. Thank you for taking the time, your time, energy, uh, and effort, and insight and knowledge for sharing it with us here in this series. We appreciate that. And of course, to all of you watching along at home, again, a big thank you uh, for sticking with us through those tech difficulties earlier, tuning in, watching uh, in live, uh, live broadcast on the uh, Jefferson Educational Society's Facebook page, or a, uh, a later broadcast. If you're streaming or listening, we appreciate you tuning into this. Again, we are gonna be right back here uh, to examine the fusion thread and to present Talking Tapestry, where we'll take questions from you, the viewers, and discuss uh, other threads throughout the American Tapestry Project on Tuesday, November 10th, live at noon, on the JES Facebook page. And of course, uh, each episode, prior is available on demand streaming on the website, jesery.org. There you'll catch other discussions featuring Dr. Andrew Roth, including two looks on 1968. You can also check out his prolific book notes series uh, and, and read any one of those 32, about to be 33 installments found over there, as well as a plethora of other publications from other contributors, um, writing about timely issues to reports and essays and more, jesery.org. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.